My name is Jamie Miller. I'm a vice president at the Institute, and I work on um, a good chunk of the content that you'll see here today. Um, it's a huge, oh, so please um, quiet your cell phones and tweet about it and all that. Um, it's a huge pleasure uh, to be here today to introduce Raj Chetty and also Jillian White from The Atlantic. Um, Raj and I met in Paris, which I like to say because I never get to say that about anyone. So um, he, came, he came and spoke at our City Lab conference in Paris and um, gave an amazing presentation about uh, geograph the geography of mobility, which um, like really down to neighborhoods and, and how economic mobility could be pinpointed um, in different neighborhoods in a city. And it was so eye-opening, really disturbing, but really important. Um, and he's here today um, to talk about restoring the American dream through big data. And what everybody should take away from this, if it'll become clear after he says it, is how everyone can be using, especially people who are working in government and the private sector um, and nonprofits, can really uh, use data to empower um, their efforts um, for, for equity and more opportunity. Um, so I really thank Raj for coming, finally, to the Ideas Festival. We're so glad to have him. Also, Jillian White will sit down with him after he gives a presentation. They'll sit down and talk, uh, ask some questions, and then you'll have an opportunity um, to ask some questions as well. Jillian White is a senior editor at The Atlantic. Um, she covers uh, business and workers in America, issues of equity. Um, and she's a really wonderful new voice at The Atlantic, so I suggest that you read her work as well. So with that, take it away, Raj. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jamie, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. It's uh, really a pleasure to be at the Aspen Ideas Festival, and I'm looking forward to getting to know many of you. So I'm going to talk today about how we can restore the American dream through work in our own communities and institutions at a very local level. But I want to start at a much big, bigger picture level by talking about what the American dream is and how it's evolving over time. So as you all know, the American dream is a complicated concept that means different things to different people. I want to start by thinking about one particular way to conceptualize it that has been traditionally used in the historical narrative, which is the idea that through hard work, any child in America will have the opportunity to have a higher standard of living than their parents did. <clears throat> and so in this first chart here, uh, my colleagues and I uh, set about in a paper last year to assess whether that's actually true in America and the extent to which it's true today versus in the past. So what we're doing in this chart is calculating the fraction of kids who went on to earn more than their parents did when we measure both the kids' incomes and their parents' incomes in their mid-30s and adjust for inflation. And we're looking at this statistic by the year in which the child is born. So what you can see is that for children born in the 1940s and 1950s, it was a virtual guarantee that you were going to achieve the American dream of moving up relative to your parents. 92% of children born in 1940 in America earned more than their parents did. If you look at how this has evolved over the past half century or so, you can see a pattern that we call the fading American dream. There's been a steady decline in kids' chances of doing better than their parents, such that children turning 30 today, born in the mid-1980s, uh, it's essentially a coin flip as to whether you're going to achieve the American dream of doing better than your parents. Now, this trend, I think, is of interest from an economic perspective. But more broadly, it captures, I think, a fundamental change in America that's reflected in the frustration that many people around the United States are expressing. And in my view, it's one of the most important social challenges uh, that our country faces today. Motivated by that trend, in our research group based at Stanford and Harvard, uh, we are asking the question, how can we restore the American dream? And so in what we're calling the Equality of Opportunity Project, we address that question from various angles. Much of our work has three common themes, which I will illustrate to you today. The first is to use big data to study how to increase upward mobility. You hear a lot about big data nowadays in the private sector, companies like Amazon and Google using large data sets to improve the products they offer. Analogously, my vision is that we can use such data to improve our understanding of key economic and social policy questions, like social mobility. 
Second, you'll notice that in our work, we analyze a broad range of interventions. We don't focus on one specific angle, like improving the quality of schools or uh, something else. Uh, rather, our view is that you need to think about a variety of different solutions to these complicated problems. And we organize much of our analysis using a life course perspective, thinking about interventions from childhood to adulthood. Finally, so while that really broadens the scope, and you might ask, how do you make sense of what to focus on given such a big problem, such a big potential set of solutions? A lot of what we do is to study the roots of the problems we're analyzing locally at a very fine-grained level to develop tailored solutions. So I find a useful analogy to think about how to uh, structure tackling these problems is sort of a precision medicine approach. So we're all familiar in the medical context with the way we think about dealing with health problems. If you go to the doctor, get a diagnosis for some symptoms you might have. The doctor then thinks about prescribing a treatment to you, and then you might have a follow-up visit where you assess whether that treatment's working. Ultimately, through that process, we hopefully have better health down the road. Analogously, I think with modern data, modern research techniques, we can apply a similar approach to social science. So what are the analogs of those three steps? The context of social science, you'd think about first an assessment or diagnosis step, <clears throat> where we identify areas where opportunity is currently lacking. Second, we turn to policy pilots. So this is the analog of the treatment phase, where we work with local stakeholders, people in local government, housing authorities, colleges, schools, to develop targeted interventions. We then turn to an evaluation phase to assess whether what we did actually worked and disseminate those lessons more broadly in the hopes of achieving scalable policies to increase upward mobility. So what I'm gonna do in the presentation this morning is give you a few examples of how we work through the sequence in the context of specific problems relevant for understanding upward mobility in America. And I'll start with the assessment phase by describing an analysis where we measure upward mobility across America using anonymized data from census and tax records that cover 20 million children linked to their parents. So basically all kids born in America between 1978 and 1983, that's about 20 million children, we're gonna take their data using information from tax returns, connect them to their parents, and use that to analyze in a very fine way the determinants of upward mobility in the United States. Now critically, we're gonna assign kids to locations where they grew up and measure their average incomes and other outcomes in adulthood in their mid-30s. So I emphasize grew up there because I'm gonna show you a lot of locational data in the next few slides. And keep in mind that the locations I'm referring to are where kids grew up, not where they currently live in adulthood. And that distinction will be important as you will see. Now the key innovation in what we're gonna present here relative to existing information that those of you who work with these types of data would see from census data or things you see in the news, or just even anecdotally from driving around your city, you have a sense of which neighborhoods look better and which look worse. The key distinction in these data is that we are tracing the roots of outcomes like poverty and incarceration back to the childhood neighborhoods where kids grew up. So we're not asking where do high income and low income people live today. We're saying what are the places where if you grow up there, you're likely to do better or likely to do worse, which is really critical for understanding upward mobility across generations and economic opportunity. So let me dive into the data by showing you this map here first. So this map shows you the geography of upward mobility in the United States. Specifically, what it's showing is the average household income of kids whose parents earned $25,000, who were at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution. So think of this as the outcomes of kids growing up in low-income families. And what we've done is divided the US into 740 different metro and rural areas, take the set of kids who grow up in each of those areas, and compute their average incomes in adulthood, conditional on growing up in a low-income family. So start by looking at the scale of this map. Green colors depict areas with higher levels of upward mobility. Red colors depict areas with lower levels of upward mobility. You can see there's a really wide spectrum here, right? Even growing up in a family at the same income level, if you grow up in a place like Dubuque, Iowa, or actually much of Colorado here, you see really green colors. Kids who grow up in low-income families do really well there, earning something like $45,000 a year on average, which is quite high for kids growing up in low-income families. In contrast, if you 
look at places like Atlanta, Georgia, much of the Southeast, the industrial Midwest, see much, much lower levels of upward mobility, kids earning something like $25,000 a year. Now, I think Atlanta is an interesting case because it highlights the distinction between upward mobility and what is currently a, a prospering economy for adults. So as you'll all know, Atlanta is really viewed as the engine of job growth in the South. It's a booming economy. But on this measure, Atlanta does not look very good in terms of rates of upward mobility. So what's happening there is Atlanta is sort of importing talent from other places. Lots of people move to Atlanta to get those high paying jobs, but the low income kids who grow up in Atlanta themselves do not end up benefiting from that booming economy for whatever reason. And so that illustrates why it's crucial to focus on upward mobility separate from economic growth. Okay, so in this big map, you see the broad regional variation. The center of the country looks good in terms of upward mobility, some places on the coast and so forth. What I wanna do next is show you that a lot of that variation remains or actually even is amplified within our cities. So I'm gonna take one example showing you data from Seattle, which is where we've started to do this work. Later this summer, we'll be putting out analogous data for the entire United States. So you'll be able to see for every neighborhood in America, what does upward mobility look like? What we're doing in this map is showing you census tract by census tract. These are units of 4,000 people each, the same statistic that I showed you on the national map before. And what I want you to see here is notice the spectrum of colors and the range of variation is basically the same. In fact, it's larger within Seattle than what you saw in the nation as a whole. So you can go one mile away from the central district in Seattle, for example, and see much better outcomes for low-income kids growing up there. And so motivated by that, I wanna now turn to how we can use these types of data for specific policy applications that try to increase upward mobility. So when we started to put out these types of data, start to get a lot of questions from housing authorities, whereas you might know we spend about $45 billion a year in the US on various affordable housing policies. And housing authorities approached us and said, you know, can we use these data to identify where we should be building this affordable housing, where low-income families with housing vouchers should be living? So what we first did is just a simple assessment, where do families receiving Section 8 housing vouchers from the government, rental assistance from the federal government, about two million families in the US who receive such assistance, where are they actually currently living in Seattle? So these dots show you the most common locations where uh, families with housing vouchers currently live in Seattle. And what you can see is that they tend to be clustered in the red and orange colored parts of the map. They're not in the green colored parts of the map, which raises a concern. We see this not just in Seattle, but more broadly across the US, it raises the concern that we're spending all this money on housing vouchers, but families aren't actually using uh, that expenditure to buy better opportunities for their kids. So a simple thing you might think about is what if we tried to help the families receiving these housing vouchers move to areas that we see in greener colors on this map where you see better outcomes. So for example, a place like Normandy Park that I had showed you before, which has better outcomes than the central district, which is in a relatively red color on this map. So the first question you'd wanna ask in assessing that type of moving to opportunity intervention is whether it's actually the case that if a child moves to a greener colored area on the map, you actually see better outcomes for that given child. Or is it just that the people who live in certain neighborhoods are different in certain ways from the people who live in other neighborhoods, so maybe neighborhoods don't actually have a direct effect on how well a given child would do. So to show you how we go about answering that question, imagine a simple example. So we've done large analyses of millions of families who move across neighborhoods. I'm gonna show you the results of that analysis in the context of a simple example. So let's say we take a set of families that start out in the central district where we saw kids on average who grow up there in a low income family have earnings of $29,000 in adulthood. Now imagine that those families moved to Normandy Park, which was in a greener color on the map. And let's look at their kids' outcomes based on the age at which they move. Starting with children who move when they are exactly uh, two years old, okay? So what we're gonna do here is look at a set of families who moved when their child was exactly two years old, trace that child forward using our data for about 30 years, look at their incomes in adulthood, 
And we see that child on average is earning about $37,000 in this example. Okay, so that's for kids who move when they're exactly two. Now let's repeat that analysis for kids who move when they're three, four, five, and so on. And what you see is a very clear declining pattern. The later you make that move from the central district to Normandy Park, the less of a gain you get. If you move by the time you're a young adult in your early 20s, you get essentially no gain at all. So there are three key lessons that emerge from this chart that I think are very relevant for thinking about policy intervention. First, it really matters where you grow up for long-term outcomes. Neighborhood environments really play a key role in determining upward mobility. Second, what really seems to matter is childhood environment, not just conditions in adulthood, not just things like labor market conditions or the availability of jobs, but rather something that's going on during childhood. And third, you can see every extra year of childhood matters for better outcomes. If you're in a better environment when you're 10 instead of 15, you continue to see significant improvements. So it's not just about the very earliest childhood years, which a lot of people focus on nowadays, but also about later years as well. Okay, so that raises the possibility that uh, moving to opportunity could potentially be a sensible solution. But some of you, when you were looking at that map of Seattle, if you're familiar with the Seattle area, you might have noticed that many of the green colors on the map were in places like Bellevue, which you might think intuitively, sure, th as a theoretical possibility, it seems great if we can have low-income kids growing up there, they'd have better outcomes, and this analysis sort of demonstrates that. But <clears throat> Of course, that's gonna be completely unaffordable for a family with housing vouchers. So does that really make sense as a practical policy to think about? And so what I wanna show you next is it actually does make sense as a practical policy. And so the way we can assess that is by looking at the price of buying economic opportunity for your kids in Seattle. So what we're doing here is for every neighborhood, which is represented by a dot on this chart, we're plotting the data that you were seeing on the map, the average outcomes of kids growing up in the low-income families on the vertical axis against median rents for a two-bedroom apartment in that neighborhood on the horizontal axis. So there's an upward sloping relationship here. If you look at the far right, those would be places like Bellevue. They do, in fact, have better outcomes. So you can, you know, one expensive way to buy opportunity is to go to a place like Bellevue. But what you can see is there's a lot of dispersion around that line. In particular, if you take a place like the Central District, it's a relatively low opportunity place, as we've seen. But turns out that you can move straight up on this chart, basically, and move to a place like Normandy Park, which is the example I've been giving you, which actually is slightly less expensive than the Central District and would be perfectly affordable for low-income families receiving housing vouchers. And so there are a cluster of areas that we think of as opportunity bargains in the upper left here, which are places where low-income kids would do very well that would be affordable to families with housing vouchers. So motivated by that, we've to show you how we go from this assessment phase to policy interventions and actually trying to have an impact, we are doing a pilot now that's in the field with the Seattle Housing Authority in collaboration with HUD that we're calling Creating Moves to Opportunity, which involves about 2,000 families where we're basically trying to help families when they come in to apply for a housing voucher, find housing in what's potentially a higher opportunity area for their kids. Now critically, note that we're not trying to take a family that's happily living in some neighborhood and get them to move somewhere else. The way I think about this is we're just changing the flow when somebody comes into the housing authority and is planning to move anyway, we're trying to one, give them some information about these opportunity bargain areas, give them a bit of financial assistance, to potentially move to a place like Normandy Park if they want to. Second, we're working on the landlord side of the market to get them to be more interested in renting their apartments to housing voucher holders, so simplifying the inspection process, giving them an insurance fund, things like that. And finally, we're providing kind of a brokerage service or a housing locator service to bring together the landlords and the tenants to make this all work. So that's one example, as you can see, <coughs> of moving from data research in a very specific way to concrete policy interventions that importantly, without spending more money from the federal government, hopefully will allow us to achieve better bang for the buck with the programs we already have. Okay, so that's one example. I now wanna to turn to a second very different example. 
so the moving to opportunity approach, I think, is potentially attractive on some small scale. But of, of course, it has limits to scalability. You, your answer can't be that you're just going to move people to increase opportunity, because th that's not possible on scale. So ultimately, you need to think about how to increase upward mobility within low opportunity areas. Once again, I think big data can help us identify which community level initiatives are most valuable. I'm going to illustrate that by focusing on one specific example, one very important example, racial disparities in economic opportunity. So I'll start with this chart, which shows you how prospects for upward mobility vary between black and white men in America. So what we're doing here is plotting the average income percentile, where you end up in the income distribution, for black men and white men versus their parental household income. So there are 100 dots here, one for each percentile of the parental income distribution. And, you can, and the blue dots are for white men. The, black, the red dots are for black men. And what you can see is throughout the income distribution, at a given level of parental income. So for instance, if you were growing up in a family at the 25th percentile, earning about $25,000 a year. As a white boy, you end up about 10 percentiles higher in the income distribution as an adult than as a black man. Okay. Now, what was striking to me about this chart, what I was quite surprised by, is that I had expected when we started this project that there would be some convergence between these lines at the top. That at some point, if you were sufficiently affluent, race would be less important. As you can see, that hypothesis was totally wrong. There's a constant gap across the income distribution. Even if you're born to families in the top 1% of the income distribution, earning more than $650,000 a year, you're still uh, 10 percentiles point, percentile points lower if you're a black man than a white man in terms of your outcomes in adulthood. Now, 10 percentiles, is that a big difference? Is that a small difference? It's a little bit hard to get a feel for that. So a different way to say this is that black men's rates of downward mobility are much higher than white men's rates of downward mobility. And I think the nicest and most salient illustration of that is given by this chart here, which the New York Times constructed using our data. So what this chart is showing is saying, let's take a bunch of men who start out in high-income families growing up in the top 20% of the income distribution and track their outcomes in adulthood. Which quintile do they end up in from the bottom fifth to the top fifth? The purple dots are for black men. The green dots are for white men. So notice that if you look for white men, you're much more likely to stay at the top of the income distribution if your parents were high income to begin with. You're five times as likely to stay in the top quintile as you are to fall to the bottom fifth. In contrast, if you look at black men, you see, I think, a really heartbreaking and disturbing pattern about uh, the, the opportunities for black men in America, which is that these purple dots really cascade downward toward the bottom. Even if you grew up in a high income family, you have really high odds of ending up at the bottom or towards the middle of the income distribution. So the way I think about it visually is if you think about achieving the American dream as climbing an income ladder for white Americans, it's more like being on a treadmill for black Americans. Even after you climb up in one generation, you end up falling back down due to structural forces such that you have to make the climb again. Now, that's the pattern you see for black men. The reason I started out breaking this down by gender is that the gender breakdown is extremely important here. If I repeat the same analysis I showed you before for women, you see a completely different pattern. In fact, conditional on parental income, at a given parental income level, black women have higher earnings than white women. The gap is reversed. And so these challenges in terms of rates of upward mobility and downward mobility are particularly strong for black men in America, which is something I think is important to pay attention to in the policy context. So what I want to do next is bring this back to a geographic lens uh, by asking how these disparities for black and white men vary across the United States. Uh, and so uh, what we're doing here is showing you the same maps that I started out with um, for black men on the left, white men on the right. So where do you end up in the income distribution conditional on growing up in a low income family? And what is amazing about this chart, I think, is that it looks like these two maps have been placed on two different color scales. 
but in fact, they have not. They're on the same color scale. It's just that the very best places in terms of upward mobility for black men, a place like Boston, for example, where low-income black men earn $24,000 on average, they have lower outcomes than the very worst places in terms of upward mobility for white men, places like Atlanta, for instance, where low-income white men earn $26,000. So these racial disparities in upward mobility for men are so profound that the two distributions are essentially non-overlapping. It's like you have two different Americas, basically, for black and white men. Now, that's true not just at the broad regional level, but it turns out if you zoom in further and look within specific neighborhoods, like I was showing you in Seattle, you find that black boys have lower chances of climbing the income ladder than white boys, even if they grow up on exactly the same city block, attend the same school, are raised in two-parent families with comparable income, education, and wealth. And that, I think, is an important finding because it shows that a traditional narrative that many of us have had, that racial differences are largely about class differences and residential segregation. If only we could get black and white kids to attend the same schools and live in the same neighborhoods, we would perhaps close the black-white gap. That is unfortunately just not true. Uh, you need to do more than that. You really need to do more than that in order to have an impact on black-white disparities in the United States. And so what do you, in fact, need to do? We don't know the answer exactly yet, but we can give you some sense of the places we should look um, by uh, looking at where we see bigger versus smaller gaps between blacks and whites in the United States. So we look across all these different neighborhoods in America and ask, are there some places where you see relatively good outcomes for black men. And it turns out, to summarize in a very brief way, there are basically three characteristics of places where you see relatively good outcomes for black men. First, those places tend to have low poverty rates. So that makes sense intuitively. They tend to be places that have good resources, good schools, things like that. But that turns out not to be enough. If you just have low poverty rates, you actually have bigger black-white disparities in such neighborhoods relative to other places. You need two other things in addition. Uh, and so the first, which is intuitive, is places with lower levels of racial bias tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. So we can use, for example, Google search indices for racial epithets as a proxy for racial bias. And you find that places with less racial bias on that measure see better outcomes for black men. The other factor, which is intriguing, is that places with higher rates of father presence among black families, so more black fathers in the household at the neighborhood level, tend to have better outcomes for black boys. Now, interestingly, that association holds only for black men, not for black women. The rate of father presence in a neighborhood has no association with the outcomes of women. It's something specifically about men, perhaps pointing to a channel like role model effects, mentoring effects, changes in social norms within a neighborhood, and so forth. And so all of this you can see is part of sort of the diagnosis phase. And so now I want to show again how you can start to think about how we move this um, towards uh, intervention. So we're f less far along in this context, but you can think about various potential interventions in the context of mentoring, criminal justice reform, racial debiasing, which various organizations are pursuing. We're starting to partner with these groups to figure out how we might improve opportunities for black men in our communities. So I'm gonna take a few final minutes to show you one uh, final set of results that gives you a different angle on these issues. So the traditional argument for equality of opportunity is based on principles of justice. The idea that no matter what your background is, you should have a shot at achieving the American dream. That's what America is all about. But what I want to show in th these remaining uh, few minutes is that improving opportunities for upward mobility can also increase economic growth. So even if you set aside that interest in justice and you just want to maximize GDP, you still might be interested in increasing social mobility. And so to illustrate that, I'm going to focus on one specific pathway to upward mobility, which is innovation. So what we do in this next study I'm going to show you is link information from the universe of patent records in the United States to tax data in order to study the lives of inventors in America as measured by having a patent when you're an adult. And so I'll start with this chart, which shows you patent rates versus parent income. And so what you can see here is that if you happen to be born to a high-income family, 
you are much more likely to end up being an inventor than if you're born to a lower income family. So in particular, if you're born to parents in the top 1% of the income distribution, you're 10 times as likely to go on to have a patent as you are if you're born to a middle or lower income family. Now, one potential explanation for why we see that big innovation gap is that this is about differences in environment and childhood uh, conditions related to the types of things I've been talking about uh, in this presentation. A different explanation, at least worth considering from a scientific point of view, is that this is about differences in ability. Presumably, the people who reached the top 1% were quite talented and abilities transmitted genetically across generations. So maybe that's why kids from high-income families are more likely to become inventors. To show you, to assess that, one way in which you can assess that is to bring in measures of ability early on in childhood. So what we're doing here is for all kids who went to New York City public schools, we're able to link in data on their test scores. It's about two and a half million kids. And we're able to look at their test scores on math tests in third grade. Each dot here represents 5% of the test score distribution. And the first simple thing we're doing is just plotting your probability of becoming an inventor versus your third grade math test scores. So the first thing you see here is that if you're at the top of your third grade math class, above the 90th percentile, you're much more likely to become an inventor in adulthood than if you're lower down in your third grade math class, which makes sense, I think, intuitively. What is more interesting from our perspective here today is if I now split this chart up, looking at the data separately for kids from high-income families and kids from low-income families, you see that that holds only if you're from a high-income family. That is, high-scoring children are much more likely to become inventors if they're from high-income families. If you're from a low-income family and you're at the top of your third grade math class, you don't have all that much higher chance of becoming an inventor. So to put it differently, in order to become an inventor in America, you need to have apparently high mathematical aptitude and you need to be from a rich family, which as you can see, you know, gives you a very different perspective on why we might be interested in improving equality of opportunity. I think, uh, you know, if we have better opportunities for low-income kids to bring them through the innovation pipeline, they themselves are much more uh, likely to become inventors, discover the next drug technology that's gonna help all of us and increase economic growth. So, uh, you know, so what exactly is it that's driving these sharp differences in rates of innovation between low and high-income kids? Uh, again, we can trace this back to the environments in which you're growing up. You can see in this map, what children's odds are of growing up to become inventors based on where they grow up. And you can see if you grow up around innovation yourself, if you grow up in a place like the Bay Area, for example, the dark blue colors are kind of hot spots of places that generate a lot of inventors. Places where you grow up around innovation or science, for instance, you see Austin, Texas being kind of an outlier in the, in the South. Uh, those kinds of places tend to produce a lot of inventors. And more generally, building on analyses like these, we see that kids who are exposed to innovation when they're growing up are more likely to become inventors. And that's what drives a lot of that gap that I was showing you between low and high income kids. Low income kids are just much less exposed to innovation while they're growing up than high income kids. One particularly salient depiction of that is if you look at differences by gender, we see that these exposure effects actually operate on gender specific lines. So if boys grow up in areas where a lot of men are inventors, they are much more likely to go into innovation themselves. If girls grow up in areas where a lot of men are inventors, that has no impact on their probability of innovation. However, if they grow up in an area where there are a lot of female inventors, they're much more likely to become inventors themselves. So again, you see childhood environment really matters in these specific ways that drives these outcomes we really care about in the long run. So let me uh, you know, conclude on that by saying, you know, here's kind of a summary of why this matters. If women, minorities, and children from low-income families were to invent at the same rate as high-income white men, the innovation rate in America would quadruple with potentially you know, commensurate effects on economic growth. And so this you know, really matters not just from the perspective of justice, but more broadly, I think, for all of us. So let me conclude by uh, coming back to the chart I started out with on the fading American dream. I think when you initially look at this chart, uh, 
you might look at it and kind of think, this is a staggering national trend. Like, how are we ever going to uh, reverse this? What can I, as one person, do to make a difference on this uh, important issue? And what I hope I've illustrated here is, while it is a critical national challenge, the roots of this uh, fading American dream really start within our local communities, within our neighborhoods, within our colleges, schools, and so forth. And so what I take is actually somewhat of an optimistic message from these data that each of us has a role to play in restoring the American dream. And we on our team look forward to working with all of you on achieving that goal. Thanks very much. So I want to start kind of where you left off in your presentation. Um, and I think you got at this with your second to last slide. But what is the thing that America is losing if we don't solve this mobility problem? Why is this the thing that you care about the most? Yeah, so I think we're losing two things. One was illustrated on that last slide, that if we just want to have the most vibrant economy in the US, uh, we're, we're losing out on that by not including making use of all the talent that we potentially have in the United States in subgroups that currently don't have the, those opportunities. But that is, in some sense, a very instrumental or sort of materialistic way to look at it. For me personally, as an immigrant to the United States, like, like many immigrants, my parents came to the United States thinking of it as the place where you could achieve anything if you worked hard, because America was the land of opportunity. And I really think that's the fundamental distinguishing principle of the United States that makes it uh, an incredible country. It's a symbol for the world. Uh, and I think we risk losing that if that's no longer true. Right. And mobility hasn't always been this difficult. I'm wondering if you have a theory on the case of why mobility has declined so much in recent decades. Yeah, so I think a lot of the factors that I was talking about, so families growing up in more segregated environments where they're less exposed to people from other backgrounds. So to take one simple example, American cities are much more residentially and racially segregated today than they were 30, 40 years ago. So if you take that innovation example I was giving you, you are much less likely to come into contact from somebody from a different background who might show you a different path today than in the past. There are also many other issues about, uh, you know, people talk about changes in family structures. So if you think about the importance of two-parent families, male role models for uh, black men, that's changed significantly over the past 30, 40 years with a larger number of kids being born to single parents, there are factors like mass incarceration, mm -hmm. which of course has a direct effect on the number of men who are in our neighborhoods. And so I think it's a confluence of policies that have led to this change. Right. So we saw some of the data that compared white Americans, white men specifically, to black Americans, black men specifically. I'm wondering how other minority groups fare in economic mobility. Yeah, so there's some interesting distinctions. I didn't show the data here for Hispanic Americans, for instance. So Hispanic Americans at present are, have similar incomes to black Americans. Right? Their average income levels are fairly similar. But what is striking in the data is that Hispanic Americans have very different rates of upward mobility. They have rates of upward mobility that are fairly close to those of white, white Americans. And so based on that analysis, we predict that within a couple of generations, for Hispanic Americans, and I should emphasize here, we're only looking at documented authorized immigrants. We're not looking at unauthorized immigrants in this analysis. Among the subset of authorized uh, immigrants, we find that for Hispanic Americans, rates of upward mobility look fairly similar to those of whites. And so they will close a lot of the income gap relative to whites across generations. In contrast, quite uh, you know, unfortunately and disturbingly, black Americans are not on a trajectory to close the income gap at all. They're, they, they're sort of stuck in place because they have much lower rates of upward mobility than white Americans. So I'm wondering how you answer this question or how you would address people who say, for instance, I have a child who goes to a really good school and there are several black or Hispanic kids in their school and I think that they'll grow up to be just fine. Um, I think a lot of people have anecdotal evidence of minorities who have grown up to do very, very well for themselves and then they see something like this, you know, down to the level of if you go to the same school, you're in the same neighborhood, those gaps are so huge and I think it's really hard for people to square that difference between what's happening in their lives and what your data says. Yeah. So I think it's important to note that for any one child, there are lots of black kids who do end up doing really well, right? So this is not some deterministic thing that's telling you about the fate of all black kids. But it is telling you about averages in a very important way. 
and averages matter from a policy point of view. If you think about what we're trying to achieve in the American economy, averages are what matter there, not one exceptional story that you might be uh, aware of. And I completely agree with your reaction, Jillian. You know, the, the finding from what I've presented, the context of racial disparities, that I think even my own academic colleagues who are familiar with our research and trust the analysis we're doing, they, they just have the reaction that I just can't believe that for kids who go to my son or daughter's school have exactly the same resources and so forth, I just find it unbelievable that they have such different outcomes. But that is simply a fact in the data. That's just the reality, and I think we have to confront that and figure out what we do about it. So I have a few more questions, but I do want to let you know that we're going to leave plenty of time for audience questions. So start thinking about them now, and when I come to you, just get those hands up high so our mic runners can see them. So one of the things that I find really interesting about your research is that the suggestion that you make isn't to take people who live in impoverished areas and necessarily move them out to better neighborhoods. It is to work on improving the neighborhoods and the opportunities where they are. I think one of the things that I find interesting is that on the ground sometimes that leads to displacement and gentrification, and then those same exact people cannot benefit from the neighborhoods they've been living in for a really long time. So I'm wondering if you have been thinking about ways to square that. It's a really good question. So you know, one of the projects we're working on at the moment is trying to understand the dynamics of gentrification and how you can basically preserve opportunity in a neighborhood while you're trying to preserve affordability of housing while you're trying to increase opportunity. So are there mixed income housing developments, for example? Is there sort of a tipping point where if you go too far, you can no longer actually preserve that equilibrium? I don't have you know, kind of a scientific answer for you. My sense from looking at the variation in the data is that there are some communities where this occurs, where you see integration, where you see better outcomes for low-income kids, and you see kids of different backgrounds living together. One encouraging thing to note there is often people, higher income families are worried about these types of efforts, both moving to opportunity and investing mm -hmm. in place. Because there's a concern that, oh, more integration might be good for lower income kids or minority kids, but maybe my kids are going to be affected by that and are gonna pay a price, and maybe I don't at an individual level wanna support that. Turns out when you look at the data, more integrated cities are better for lower income kids, but they're not actually worse for higher income kids. And so that at least I think is an encouraging sign that we'll be able to figure something out. All right. And I'm wondering how the US stacks up when it comes to economic mobility against other developed nations. Yeah, so the US at present does not look great, honestly, in terms of rates of upward mobility compared to uh, other, other countries. The, the term the American dream actually I think is sort of a misnomer at this point. As an immigrant, uh, or as a low-income kid, you would have better odds of climbing the income ladder if you were growing up in Canada than if you were growing up in the United States. Uh, and I think when you look at some of these factors in terms of the environmental uh, context in which Canadian low-income kids are growing up, quality of schools, mentors, peers, and so forth, you can start to understand why that might be the case. Um, but I think there's work ahead in the U.S. to restore uh, that, that name. All right. We want to go to the audience and make sure you guys have time for questions. Seeing one there and one there. Hi. So I, you've been talking a lot about um, localized efforts. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could share, maybe a, from a little more of a macro level, maybe what states can do yeah. um, to impact this kind of change, because they generally are um, uh, taking in lots of data and sort of siphoning it out. But if you could just sort of Absolutely. share a little bit about how states can yeah. be part of this. So uh, thank you for that. I mean, in emphasizing the local, I certainly didn't intend to mean that state or national level policies don't have a role to play. I absolutely think they do. A lot of these things, so take the example of housing, for example. Um, zoning laws play a really big role in restricting access to opportunity, basically. And states can potentially play a role in shaping uh, the ways zoning laws play out, even at a local level, that I think can have a big impact. Because any one locality doesn't really have an incentive to change zoning. So if you're like, so for instance, if you're in Palo Alto, it's in your interest to not want to allow more building there from your own personal property price perspective. But states can potentially engineer a set of transfers between different constituents that could achieve better outcomes for um, the society as a whole. 
Another very different example is, I didn't talk here, but I think higher education has a really big role to play in improving rates of upward mobility. And as you know, many public institutions in the United States are run at the state level. And I think creating better access to those institutions, there's really limited access to high quality public education. Many colleges in America, as we've shown in other data we've put out by college. So that's an important role that, that states can play. So I think there are lots of things at all tiers where these kinds of individual level data can factor into more macro decisions. Right, right there. Can you talk about the Asian subset and its influence in America? Yeah, absolutely. So the, uh, one of the other groups we've looked at in these data is Asian Americans. You see that uh, if you look at the type of chart I put up uh, where we plot black men's outcomes and white men's outcomes versus parental income, imagine that I put Asian kids' outcomes on that. What you would see is that especially for Asian kids growing up in low-income families, their outcomes look exceptionally good, much higher rates of upward mobility than kids from all other races and ethnicities. Now, that type of result has been observed anecdotally in the past and has led to a literature and a discussion on Asians as a model minority. There's a lot of discussion of that. We actually think that, that the premise of that discussion is sort of misfounded because it turns out if you then further break that data down into kids of immigrants versus kids whose parents were born in the US, so basically focus on natives, you find that Asian kids whose parents were born in the US, their outcomes look identical to those of white Americans. So it's entirely an immigrant phenomenon. It's not an Asian phenomenon per se. And I think those two things have been conflated in the prior narrative. And it's very important to make that distinction. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I was fascinated by your use of data to um, identify um, uh, characteristics of neighborhoods and also of childhood uh, environment. Um, so I was wondering if you have uh, other kinds of indicators that you can track uh, with the data, uh, such as, for example, the availability of Section 8, Section 8 eligible housing. Uh, you mentioned that a little bit. But I was also curious about things like rates of uh, you know, childhood punishment or childhood detention in schools. Uh, we know that there's a, a racial um, yep. you know, bias involved yep. there. Um, and also rates of uh, children uh, placed into sort of remedial tracking yep. kind of programs. Um, and you mentioned this a little bit about uh, neighbors having anxieties about you know, uh, their children's experiences being diluted in some way if, uh, if their schools suddenly accept more sort of low income yep. children in there. So I was curious to, if you know of like, ways to see that in the data, like NIMBY effects, not in my backyard kind of effects. Yeah. Um, so curious to know how, how you're collecting that kind of data or analyzing that data. So these are all great suggestions on additional data that can be overlaid on these types of data. So that's precisely why uh, we've already put out a lot of these data publicly at a more aggregated level by county. But in a couple of months, we'll put out by census tract information for all places in the United States. And then we hope other users will be able to take data you might have your school district, in your state, in your community, overlay that with a very simple tool we're developing to put these data together to do the types of analyses you're, you're describing. And we hope to be doing more of that ourselves. To give you one example of sort of factor that emerges from that kind of analysis that I haven't talked about here, uh, if you look at measures of connectedness of communities or social capital, those end up re being really strong predictors of these differences in upward mobility. And we're currently trying to use social network data to figure out how to quantify connectedness more precisely, figure out which subgroups and which places are disconnected at the moment, and how you might create greater connections. So I think there's a lot to do in collecting those types of data. Also on the NIMBY type front that you described, I don't have anything yet, but I think there's more coming in that vein. I think there was a question right there. Uh, it appears that uh, the macro uh, economic trends are driven by uh, effectively black male downward mobility, which appear to be caused by racial discrimination in the local geography as well as lack of father and household. Um, is there correlation between racial discrimination and lack of father and household? Have you been able to suss Good that question. out? Yeah. And then the second question would be, um, if you were to negate those two factors, how much of the gap would be closed? Yeah, yeah. So uh, on the racial discrimination and, um, and father presence, those two things are correlated, but not super highly. So you should really think of them basically as two independent explanatory factors. Uh, 
Um, to some extent, they are correlated, right? So uh, things like mass incarceration, for example, are higher in places with, so incarceration rates are higher in places with more racial discrimination, which then creates a link with a father absence. So there are connections between these things, but they play an independent role. If you equalize those two factors, let's say you could look at the small set of communities where you have a high rate of father presence among black men, you have low levels of racial bias, low poverty rates, that's something like three or 4% of neighborhoods in America, really a sliver of places. So you think about certain places in Montgomery County in Maryland, for example, areas near Silver Spring and so forth. In those places, I would say the gap is 70% smaller than what you see nationally. So it's quite a bit smaller. It's not totally closed, but it's substantially smaller, which is why we think it's worth paying a lot of attention to those factors. We don't know, to be clear, that they exactly how you change those factors. So there's a lot of work to be done on figuring out interventions, but we think it's a good place to look. All right. And I think we have time for one final question. There's one right there in the back. I was wondering if you looked at life expectancy here, because yeah. one of the big differences between 1940 and today is that the average man in America had a life expectancy of 62 at 40, yeah. and today it's 80. What role does that play? I'm wondering if you looked at yeah. defining the American dream in other ways besides yeah. a point in time income like net worth or standard yeah. of living. Yeah, so we've actually done some separate work on life expectancy in a paper published in the Journal of American Medical Association a couple of years ago. And the fact that, you, so one of the key things that emerges from that analysis is the fact you described about increasing mean life expectancy. Turns out, especially in recent decades, that the increases in average life expectancy that we're all familiar with are entirely driven by the rich living longer. Low income Americans are not living longer. In fact, the lowest income Americans actually are living shorter lives today on average than they were 15 years ago. Part of that has to do with the opioid crisis and other things you hear a lot about. And so I think you're absolutely right that these results that I've been focusing on a very specific economic measure of income they're manifested in a much broader set of outcomes. I think we'll be able to measure those more precisely going forward. We have done some work on life expectancy, and I think you know, that illustrates, I think, the gravity. And coming back to your earlier question, Jillian, why do we care about all this? This is really fundamentally about life in so many dimensions, not just how much you earn. All right, and I think that's where we need to stop. Everyone, please join me in thanking Dr. Rashtetti. Thank you.